and we, you know, my, my, my grandfather was in the military, my father was in the military, my mother still works for the government, my sister works for the government, uh, and I worked for the government. I was a staff officer uh, for the Central Intelligence Agency. I had signed up to join the U.S. military in the wake of the uh, September 11th attacks. I actually signed up for the invasion of Iraq because I believe that fundamentally our government um, had noble intents and it did good things and it did them for the right reasons. Uh, what I was not aware of, and I've, I've grown to become a little more sophisticated in this, is that while the people in government largely are uh, exactly that, they're good people trying to do good things for the right reasons, uh, there is a culture that sort of pervades the upper levels of government, the senior officials, uh, political appointees, that have basically uh, become less accountable to the public that they serve. And because of that, we see that politics and policies uh, irrevocably, sort of irresistibly, they gravitate towards the uh, prerogatives of individuals, uh, of these officials, of an elected and unelected class of bureaucrats that can sort of degrade the quality of government that we as individuals enjoy. So as I went through my time in the, uh, the classified world, the intelligence community, as we call it, uh, and I moved from the Central Intelligence Agency to the National Security Agency. I worked on both the public sides and the private sides as a contractor working for private companies, but at a government desk in government facilities using government equipment uh, and working on government programs and taking tasking from government employees. Uh, I, I gained an increasingly concerning understanding of what happens on the broad scale, what the results of all these individual decisions uh, are. And that's generally that when decisions are made in the dark, uh, the quality of those decisions is reduced. Now that's not to say that we need to know every decision that the government makes, you know, who's under investigation, what this particular program does, but we do have to have a general understanding of the, the policies and the powers broadly that a government claims if it's going to be using them in our name as well as being using them against us. Uh, and ultimately, uh, toward the end of my tenure at the NESA, I discovered that there were programs of mass surveillance uh, that were happening uh, beyond any possible statutory authority because these things were constitutionally prohibited. Uh, and I saw that there were these were things that never should have happened. Uh, they were initially authorized in the Bush administration. And that, uh, that administration actually was fully aware uh, in their own classified opinions in the Inspector General's report uh, that those programs had no statutory basis. And so we saw developments where they were trying to authorize these under the president's powers. You know, they're using Article II powers, where basically the president says, we're at war, I can do basically whatever I want. Uh, now, that may sound like a great idea uh, and be a, an important power in times of total war, in times of existential threat, uh, but we don't have U-boats in the harbor. We don't have you know, foreign armies marching on American soil. We haven't seen total war policies in the United States uh, since World War II. And so we have to ask, why were these decisions being made? Uh, why was the public not allowed to participate in the debate? And why is it that even within the separate branches of government, uh, officials were not aware of this? Um, within the executive branch, you know, in the intelligence community, many of my coworkers uh, who also had top secret clearances, high level accesses, uh, were unaware that these things were going on. The vast majority of Congress had no idea that these programs had been instituted or were being maintained. Uh, even those on the intelligence community, uh, intelligence committees, uh, in both the Senate and the House were not fully briefed, uh, only the gang of eight, uh, that'd be the, the, the chairs, the ranking members, and then the uh, majority and minority leaders for both houses, uh, are briefed on so-called covert action programs and things like that, uh, exceptionally compartmented programs. Uh, and the courts have increasingly, in, in the wake of the post 9-11 period, uh, become reluctant to scrutinize any decisions or programs that were um, constitutionally questionable, saying that they lacked the expertise or the positioning or uh, what it ultimately boiled down to was the uh, political willingness to confront difficult questions to which there may or may not be right answers uh, once they're right and wrong. Um, so this led me 
to stand up and say something about it. And I worked with American journalists and American news outlets um, to make sure that the public had an ability to make decisions about where the lines in this program should be drawn. Uh, many people are familiar with the story since then. It's still ongoing. The reporting continues. Um, but the ultimate basis is our, that many people consider the last year's surveillance of unconstitutional activity at the NSA and so on and so forth uh, to be ultimately about surveillance and mass surveillance. And that is a critical issue, and it's the one with which I'm most familiar, and I, I saw the greatest wrongdoing. However, it's important to be aware that uh, the reality that mass surveillance illustrates is that we have agencies that are working on their own authorities, they're working on their own sort of uh, institutional momentum to implement programs without oversight, uh, creating these things behind closed doors without the awareness of the public, that are actually changing the boundaries of the rights that we enjoy as free people in a free society. Um, we have lost, in many ways, the freedom to associate without judgment in the United States because of the metadata program. That's really an associational tracking program. Uh, when we have everyone's call records, we know who everyone's friends are. We know who they contact. We know what they do. We know when they travel. We know where they go. Uh, we know how long they're there. Uh, it's, there are speech implications to this. Um, there are obviously privacy implications to this. Uh, and there is a very strong argument to be made that even if we as a society believe that these, these powers and authorities would be valuable, uh, that we could not institute them through statute regardless, that they simply would be unconstitutional in any form, uh, absent an amendment. And we see this uh, happening and being upheld even through international laws decisions uh, very recently. Uh, two or three days ago, the uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Countering Terrorism and uh, Protecting Human Rights uh, delivered a report that had been in the works for, I believe, several years uh, that found that mass surveillance programs violate the uh, obligations of states that the United States and the United Kingdom and other, uh, many of our other allies have agreed to under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, um, as well as, and this wasn't mentioned specifically, but the very same um, right that he was uh, highlighting in this report uh, was an obligation we had agreed to under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, some 50 odd years back. Uh, and that's Article 12, and that's that we all have a right to uh, privacy, to be free from unjustified, unreasonable intrusions into our lives. And we have this, of course, under our own Fourth Amendment. So when it came to my story uh, and how I came forward, it was not that I saw a particular program and I had an ax to grind. Um, it was that broadly I was witness to massive violations of our Constitution, that they were happening in secret, and that they were happening as a result of a broad breakdown throughout the branches of government. And this is the key, because when there's a problem in a single agency, when there's a problem in a single branch, uh, we tend to be self-correcting. That's what checks and balances are for. But the question of whistleblowing, of when to stand up, is really one of, do those checks and balances still function? Can you report uh, these issues within a system to a certain branch, to a certain organization, to a certain office, and actually see uh, those abuses and those policies corrected? And in this case, uh, they were not. We saw um, that both the courts, uh, the Congress, and the executive had all failed in different, um, different portions of these, uh, these programs and protecting our rights. And I think we'll cover that in a little more detail later. But did that answer your question? So what's striking about the position you've described, both here and also in, in the interviews that have been that you've given, is how relatively limited it is for its justification of stepping forth with this kind of civil disobedience. I mean, in particular, you've said um, that the problem you had with what in fact happened is primarily the problem of democratic accountability. You said, quote, it's not my role to make that choice, the choice whether the NSA engages in those activities or not. Uh, instead, it's for the American people, quote, I don't intend to destroy those systems, but to allow the public to decide whether they should go on. So the key that you're emphasizing is that we had a, pr we had a process, we had a system of government that wasn't allowing the public to even know about the issues that the uh, NSA was engaging in. And, and that's the primary justification you have for stepping forward and 
obviously violating the law in order to make it public. Right. Ultimately, it comes down to a question of, uh, you know, people argue about what is a whistleblower. Um, I tried to raise uh, my concerns internally. Uh, they got nowhere. Other individuals who had done the same thing, whether they're Thomas Drake, uh, Bill Binney, um, Kirk Weeby, Ed Loomis, uh, Diane Rourke, uh, who even went to Congress, um, all of these individuals uh, raised similar concerns, and yet the issues were not corrected, they were not addressed. And that's again because of the overclassification issues um, that have been described and the way that these processes have inevitably become more cumbersome and less effective over time to the point where they're eventually broken. I think the, the ultimate mark of a, a whistleblower is when it comes to motivations, are they standing up um, to change something directly to sort of uh, have a, a partisan effect, um, sort of the deep throat thing where they're trying to you know, get their boss fired so they can move into the next job. Um, that's, not, uh, that's not whistleblowing, I think, under anyone's definition. But really, it comes down to when I stepped up, it was not to dictate outcomes. And I, I think that's ultimately the, the, the mark there. It's about allowing the public a chance to participate in democratic processes in order to play their part in uh, determining the outcome. The reality is, since, uh, since we saw the birth of sort of this unitary executive theory uh, in the White House and, and throughout American governance, um, the government has, the public has lost their seat at the table of government. We're being increasingly left out of critical discussions about the policies and the direction that we want to steer our society toward. They're being made in our name without our awareness and without our consent. But in a democratic republic, you know, the government draws its legitimacy from the consent of the people. And everybody who's involved in any kind of research knows that you know, consent is not meaningful if it's not informed. And that's what was lacking. So when I think about the question of um, you know, how do you see, uh, how do you find the line, the point of justification by which you can stand up, go to the press, and this is another key distinction, is I didn't publish any of these materials. I've never published a single story on the NSA uh, myself. Uh, because everyone has biases, right? And even though I have an expert understanding of these programs, I've worked with them personally, I know uh, the authorities they operate under, how they're used. Uh, again, I had the ability to look at anybody's email that was being ingested under these programs, um, whether that was intercepted domestically or overseas. I had the authorities to look at both. Um, but, uh, but I didn't try to push my agenda uh, onto the public because I don't think that would be proper. And I think many other whistleblowers do the same thing. That's why we go to the press. The press is a critical part of American society. It's a part of our constitutional system. That's why we have the First Amendment. Um, and it's really not the role of an individual such as myself to say what the public should and should not know. But by working in partnership with the free press, we can allow institutions that exist to make these sort of determinations, to then sit down with the government, present their evidence for why this is in the public interest. The government can make a counter case and say why this may cause some harm that may have been missed or misunderstood, uh, or the value of these programs misinterpreted by the, uh, by the journalists. Uh, and ultimately, we can get a decision from there. Uh, and there's a kind of accountability that's born from that. Uh, that's lacking when it's an individual making the decisions on.